I just need to talk like 90 more times before we get <laughs> Good evening. I'm Chuck Ryback, Dean of the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences. And thank you for joining us for our second season of No Reservations. I've gotten word that our show started a little bit early tonight <laughs> with a little advanced preview, so I apologize for that. And No Reservations is a conversation series designed to provide a forum for sharing bold, challenging, and provocative ideas. Um, we're coming to you live from UW-Green Bay's Fort Howard Hall at the Widener Center for the Performing Arts. And as usual, I'd like to thank Kelly Strickland and the staff at the Widener for making this beautiful space available to us. And for the first time of No Reservations, there are actually people sitting in the audience right now. So hey, thanks for coming. You didn't need reservations. You're here. You just <laughs> showed up. It's, it's amazing. And it's good to see you, although strange, right? Um, so yeah, welcome to anybody attending virtually and in person. Um, I'd like to introduce tonight's guest. So Dr. Jenny Young is Associate Professor of Writing, English, and Humanities at the University of Wisconsin-Green Bay, where she directs the Writing Foundations Program. 
She studied satire writing at the Second City in Chicago and has humor pieces published in McSweeney's, Slackjaw, Weekly Humorist, The Satirist, HuffPost, and others. She has a PhD in rhetoric and discourse studies and is the editor of the academic, academic satire site, The Monocle of higher education, I'm just realizing how funny that is. Um, <laughs> Professor Young will give a brief talk titled Beyond Funny, Humor as Catharsis and Social Action. And then we'll move to the question and answer portion. So please post any questions that you have in the chat. So those of you who are watching via the YouTube stream, there is the chat area there and we will take your questions live and I will ask uh, Jenny to answer those. So without further ado, Dr. Jenny Young. Thank you, Chuck. So I went to graduate school in an area of Cleveland, Ohio that has a pretty high rate of violent crime. It's kind of okay during the day, but most people try to avoid it uh, in, at night. So my mom was kind of worried about this because since I worked full time during the day, I could only take classes at night. So she used to call or text me every single day that I had class, every night that I had class, with some version of this message. <laughs> and then I'd, on my drive home after class every night, I'd call her just to tell her that I didn't get shot that night. And when I graduated, we both congratulated me on how amazing it was that I made it through an entire degree program in that area without getting shot even once. And this cracked us up for like three years straight. So this is an inappropriate joke, clearly, because the truth is that probably a lot of people did get shot during the time I was uh, pursuing that degree. But making jokes like this is something we do with humor, right? We, we recruit comedy to try to grasp hold of the thing that scares us in order to take away its power. It's, it's kind of a way of trying to mitigate what's frightening or uncontrollable to us. So things have been pretty uncontrollable over the past 18 months or so. In our lifetimes, there's never been a time that was more characterized by pain or loss or existential dread. And all of that is playing out 24 hours a day on a global scale, so we can never really escape it. And this pandemic has, re has revealed a lot of awful things about America. It's, it's exposed racial and economic inequities. It's exposed a, a dangerously fractured healthcare system. It's exposed uh, embarrassing political strife and ineptitude. But it, it's also revealed that America, in addition to being supremely messed up in some of these ways, is, is really, really funny. And that's what we're here to talk about tonight, is humor during dark times, and specifically during this pandemic and the role that it's played and that it continues to play as the pandemic continues to go on. So from the earliest days, images like these started circulating in digital media, ranging from you know somewhat lighthearted, stuff that most people would laugh at, Maybe things that were relatable. <laughs> this one is maybe a little bit dated, but most of, <laughs> most of us in this room right now get this reference. This is pretty funny. Someone wrote a Tinder profile for the coronavirus. And the slide, I'll read it because I'm not sure how well it's reading, but it says coronavirus, 29 years old, uh, goes to Wuhan University, lives in Wuhan. It's less than a mile away from you right now. Uh, new in town, looking for some fun with the yum emoji, which is kind of particularly gross and disturbing given that it's the coronavirus. Uh, currently traveling around China and planning to travel all over the world soon. Globe emoji, heart eyes emoji. I love being outdoors, crowded places, and food markets, masks and goggles, huge turnoff, swipe left if you're a doctor. <laughs> I'll take your breath away and leave you in bed for days. Heart face and like wine clank. So funny, good writing. I mean, I kind of wish I had written it, but also kind of morbid, getting a little bit morbid. 
and, the, and maybe a little more morbid. <laughs> Combining some current events with the pandemic itself in some pretty dark ways. Mocking America's tendency to take both news and medical advice from Twitter and how that might not be the best source. Re getting really dark. This is The Onion. This is an Onion headline. And The Onion is, if you're not familiar with it, the original fake news, humorous fake news site. And another one from The Onion. <laughs> right. So. <laughs> It's okay to laugh. We'll talk in a minute about why it's, why it's okay to laugh at this. So many of us find ourselves laughing at these while saying, no, that's not funny. That's, like, that's not okay. Too far, Onion, too far, while still laughing. So is it okay, is it ever okay to make jokes about COVID-19 that involve both grieving school children and COVID victims? I'm, I'm saying yes, it's, it's okay, and we're going to talk about why, why it's okay. So for one thing, this kind of humor can actually be very healing. Uh, Naomi Bagdonis, who is a humor researcher and co-author of a book titled Humor Seriously, explains that when we laugh with someone, whether in person or virtually, we actually get a particular cocktail of hormones that strengthens our emotional bonds with those people. So it's hard to imagine a time when people have been more in need of emotional bonds than, than during the past year and a half. And that's part of why we share these things on social media. It's, it's part of the, the reason why this little dog meme, which was actually a thing far before the pandemic, was taken up again in 2020 and, and turned into what we call a multi-generational meme that grew increasingly desperate and increasingly more specific as the pandemic unfolded. And I think for many of us, this, this little dog and other characters like him sort of, sort of tracked our own emotional responses from those first early reports out of China where we said, yeah, there's some strange virus. It's, yeah, it's not going to make it here. It's not going to be a problem for us. To, well, OK, it's here. It's here. The virus is here. but. It's a mild respiratory bug. It's nothing to be concerned about. So then exploding into what's basically a, you know, a planetary disaster that's going to change everything forever. And I think it was recognition of ourselves in these kind of um, you know, jokey memes that, and, and seeing ourselves reflected in like this little dog's psychological evolution that sort of explains its, ubiqui its ubiquity uh, on the internet. Another good thing we know about humor, dark humor or otherwise, is that it makes us more resilient and it makes us more creative and it makes us more resourceful. So in those ways, it was more important than ever during the pandemic. We needed to be all of those things to survive and just to keep going and to keep doing what we do. Lori Day, who is a psychologist and also the moderator of a, of a large Facebook group called Pandemic Gallows Humor, told the New York Times that many of her group's members were actually ill with COVID themselves at the time that they joined the group. They're thanking me from their beds, she said. They're thanking me from their hospital rooms. So if they're laughing at this, does it make it OK for all of us to laugh at it? I can tell you that if you, if you feel bad, about laughing at, at this kind of humor, it might make you feel better to know that a 2017 study found a fairly strong correlation between high intelligence and a preference for dark humor. It also found no correlation between a preference for dark humor and aggression or mood disorders. So what that means is that if you laughed at, at these memes, you're not only smart, but you're also probably not a psychopath. So that's good to know, right? At least it made me feel better about myself when I read that study. Another good thing to know is that if you laugh at this kind of humor, you're effectively applying an emotional regulation strategy called cognitive reappraisal. So 
The way cognitive reappraisal works in this case is that this kind of humor takes something negative or threatening, so like my mom's fear that I was going to get shot at graduate school, and reframes it as comedy, which is always inherently less threatening to us and easier to mentally deal with. Mark Twain, who was one of America's uh, best and darkest satirists, said that the human race has one really effective weapon, and that is laughter. So again, if, you, if this kind of thing cracks you up, not only are you not a sicko, but in addition to being smart and emotionally well-balanced, you're also effectively strategic in, 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 in using tactics to, uh, to get through and survive dark times. So I do a lot of humor writing, and I teach satire writing here on campus, and I always keep a post-it note at the top of my laptop that, that says, anchor yourself in truth, not jokes. And I don't remember where I read that, but it's just another version of the more popular, um, it's funny because it's true, which apparently really did come from Homer Simpson. I had to research that for this talk, and he's apparently the author of that quote. But I think that is the real key to why we turn to dark humor during dark times. Because I think it's, it's honest and true, and that feels a little better to us in some ways than denying reality. And to me, it actually feels more respectful. If you, if you think about it, during a time when the whole world is characterized by pain and fear, how could the humor that comes into that space not be tinged by darkness? In a way, that seems worse, because it seems a little bit phony. Humor is part of humanity, and it's part of being human, but it has to reflect the realities of being human at the particular point in time. I don't see how any of us could have weathered the pandemic by cracking dad jokes or sitting around telling each other puns. That just, it feels a little lightweight or a little frivolous, I think, for where we are right now. I think we have an emotional need to match both the tone and the intensity of whatever we're confronting. Otherwise, I think it's a, we might be a little delusional. We're treading into crazy town territory. Imagine watching a really violent scene in a horror movie and hearing like happy sing-song music in the background. Isn't that, that's way worse, right? It makes it much creepier. I think it's been the same thing with pandemic humor. Even if we don't necessarily interrogate it that way while we're taking it in, I think we have a need to be emotionally honest with our humor and that's why I think the pandemic humor has gotten so dark. It's been a dark time. And that's generally what resonates with us in terms of humor. We laugh when we're confronted with something that rings true, that touches our current reality in some really precise and undeniable way. And if it does that in a surprising manner, then it's even funnier. And frequently, the surprising aspect comes from some kind of shock value, some sort of harshness or darkness. Uh, Sarah Silverman, the comedian, in the documentary The Last Laugh, which is actually about um, humor and the Holocaust, describes this phenomenon saying, oh my God, that's awful and hilarious. It's awful hilarious. The screenwriter Larry Charles in the same movie says, subjects come up that are inappropriate for comedy and that's the place that is the most interesting to explore. So as someone who writes humor, I, I definitely agree with that. I think that is the place that's, that's the most interesting to explore. It's definitely the most challenging. There are, however, some rules we rely upon when writing this kind of comedy or writing humor. And, and probably the most important one is that you always punch up. So your target, the target of your humor or your joke has to be above the other elements in the joke. That's probably the most important rule of dark humor. So if we go back to this meme, the, the reason it's okay to invoke both grieving school children and COVID victims is that ne neither of those things is the target of the joke. The target of the joke is something else. It's, it's the bad decision-making of people in power. 
it's a systemic failure, it's maybe the coronavirus itself, and that's okay to do. It's okay to punch up at the obvious bad guy like the coronavirus. You can also punch up at people in positions of power. They already have the power. And people in positions of, of political or economic power are inherently up, and it, it's okay to punch at them. And believe me, the hardest part of putting this slide presentation together was picking the one image to use here because there are so many of them. Um, I, t I tell my satire writing students to, to try to not be overly concerned about offending someone as long as they're a fair target for the game or the joke or the piece. Um, if you're not offending anyone, it's probably not satire, just sort of by definition. And I think it's... I think it's okay to be brave with humor. I think that comedy can be a call to action. I think it can be a perfectly valid form of political activism. And I think it's been employed pretty effectively in those ways. And it can be risky. It can be very risky, but you know, all of life is risky, right? All of life is a calculated risk, and, and creating this kind of humor is, is one of those things. It, I've, I've personally had more than one editor tell me, like, yeah, this is too dark. <laughs> it's, it's funny, but we can't publish it. And sometimes I end up placing it, you know, somewhere else with an editor that feels different than that. And, and sometimes, you know, even I think, yeah, that, that is definitely way too dark. And then it just goes into my file of things I've written that will never see the light of print, which is fine. That's part of being a writer. Uh, Ricky Gervais, the, the creator of The Office, has a fantastic quote about what you are and are not allowed to say in terms of comedy. And I have to ask you to please excuse the language, but it really is, it's a great quote and it's, and it's relevant to this conversation. So I'll let you read it. It's a good system, he says. I, th I think that it is a good system. And I think it taps into sort of our collective ability to decide what's okay for wherever we are right now. And, and right now, fall of 2021, 18 months or so into this pandemic, is a really fascinating time to consider humor and its place in our lives. And I'll close by uh, thanking you for being here to consider it with me tonight. So, thank you. Thanks so much, Jenny. I really appreciate it. And Thank you. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for joining us. I, I feel like this Thanks. topic is really important for a lot of reasons. So it, humor is in, important to me. And mm -hmm. it also feels like it's in this cultural place where it causes a lot of conflict that you get in trouble for being yes, we do. funny, <laughs> <laughs> right? And so your, your comment, too, about that there's a lot of risk with humor, I mm -hmm. find, to be very real. So if you're reading something that is meant to be funny and nobody's laughing, that's different than reading a dramatic piece and everybody's quiet like they're supposed to be. Right. <laughs> and in your head, you're like, wow, they really love this. Um, so I guess why, what about this genre draws you to it? You know, of all the genres you could pick to express yourself in and right. convey ideas, like why this one and why is it important to you? I think I have three answers to that. Wow, um, that's great. Well, yeah, right. we'll see if I remember them <laughs> now that I said okay. that. Um, number one, humor is important to me, too. Mm -hmm. like, it's just something I enjoy. It's sort of what makes life you know, survivable, yeah. entertaining, and everything else. So that's one, just you know, fondness for Yep, Agreed. For that concludes genre. tonight's episode. Thank you. You've said it all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we <laughs> yeah. enjoy it. Um, so, so I like that. Um, the other thing I like is that <laughs> just to be honest, mm -hmm. it allows me to critique things I want to critique anyway, but like in an art form that's academically valid, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? I mean, this is a form of writing. It's a form of expression. I can't just, you know, walk onto campus and start ranting, yeah. you know, but it's not that everything I write is about academia, but you know, a lot of it is, right? Yeah. And, and humor is a good vehicle to sort of critique systemic problems. So I like that. Um, the other thing I really like about humor writing is it is so hard. It's, it's way hard, to me, way harder than academic writing, mm -hmm. way harder than um, 
argumentative writing way harder than creative nonfiction or fiction because I think partly because it is such a risk, right? You don't really know how anything's going to land. And because it's so subjective, like something you, you know, I might think is hilarious might yeah. be like, yeah, I don't, it's not doing it for me. So I like the challenge of it. And I, I really dove into it during the pandemic mm -hmm. because I was living in a studio apartment by myself in yeah. Green Bay, Wisconsin. I mean, it, it is a real challenge to try yeah. to create something that elicits like a specific bodily response from someone mm -hmm. in the form of laughter. Like, try to give somebody that task in another setting, walk into a room and make people do X, and it's a bodily response. It's almost right. impossible, but it also feels, that, do you feel like humor as a genre is, I mean, there's risk involved, so mm -hmm. I feel like there's a contradiction in that. A lot of people don't take it seriously as a right. genre. So would you, publishing five humor pieces, how do people respond to that versus <laughs> your serious academic right. article on Twain? Yeah, I, I think it depends on the crowd, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I, I feel really fortunate to be here because so many of our colleagues yep. do have a good sense of humor. Agreed. So I, you know, I listed McSweeney's on my CV when I go up for review or, or whatever. That, and that wouldn't fly anywhere. So, I mean, that's a rule of humor, yeah. too. You have to know your audience. That's a really wild thing to be able to do I that. Know. Like, <laughs> right. But I love McSweeney, so it makes perfect sense. Right. Right? So since you mentioned academia, and we do have a question or two coming in. So, I, you know, in reading through you're writing for this, which I really enjoyed, and thanks for sending all of that along. But let's just say that academia is a big, is in your field of vision in yeah. terms of things to write about. So I guess my question is, what is it about academia that's so <laughs> ripe for satire? Well, I mean, it's a weird world, right? Mm -hmm. Academia, like it's different than everything else. And I think that if, if people outside of academia heard the stuff that we argue about inside the academy, mm -hmm. it's kind of ridiculous. A lot of it, right? I yeah. mean, it just is. Yeah, it's more than kind of, but it, yeah. Right, <laughs> yeah, it's more than kind of. Sure. So number one, it's this really specific culture. And similar to, I mean, corporate America has been the target of so many jokes and mm -hmm. memes, and there's whole, you know, like generators of, of corporate language yeah. and stuff. Yep. But academia is, well, number one, it's becoming more corporate. But it's also, it's that specific of a world, I think, mm -hmm. I mean, that which, has so many idiosyncrasies. So, I mean, you're pointing to something interesting to me is that with academia and the corporate world, that the real focus of the satire, more often than not, is language itself. Like, mm -hmm. we make fun of corporate buzzwords and right. I mean we could just start generating some right now like right. flexibility and flexovation <laughs> and yeah. I'm pivoting like right. you wouldn't freaking <laughs> believe um, and it, is that the same with academia like what is it about I mean if to me if the humor is going to have a purpose and it's going to shine a light on something mm -hmm. wh what is it what are you noticing about the language of academia and so I'm thinking of your the piece that you wrote about passion as being the most important mm -hmm. teacher quality that yeah. you could have, and then uh, also the one about the politically neutral professor mm -hmm. and all that. So it, this is a really general question. What are you doing there? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I'm outright mocking our expectations yep. of teachers, right? I, so I started out as a high school teacher, and I, mm -hmm. I think this is more of a problem in K-12 than it is in higher ed. I think in higher ed, we are valued for what we know, you know, for our ex for subject matter expertise or whatever. Mm -hmm. I think in K-12, and I, I say this having spent time there, yep. there is this pre pressure to be like, well, how much do you love the children? You know, which is important, but also like how much do you know about mathematics yeah. or whatever it is you're teaching? And I think that's gotten kind of eclipsed in, in recent years where it's become this like passion contest. So mm -hmm. that's, that's where that one came from. And the political neutrality, I mean, we, that's a problem for us too in higher yeah, ed. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, the, yeah, which I don't know. I mean, it seems a little silly in some ways because we're, we're teaching adults, right? We're not, we're not mm -hmm. getting people during their formative years right. to like, you know, brainwash them into our, our wild liberal ideas. As if that were possible. <laughs> right, right. But. right. 
but but there is that sentiment out there that we should you know some appear robotic or, or yeah. whatever which to me I mean st students of any age see right through that so it seems like a bit of a farce and it feels like you are punching up in that case to use the language that you used in that you know personally like if I were in a classroom I I don't want people to be neutral no, like, me neither. I I want them to care like right. I, I want them to think about things and so they it seems that you'd be punching up then at the very deliberate political apparatus which is meant to shackle people linguistically right. while they interact with others. Right. And it's offensive. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so there is a question um, that came in. This is going to shift topics a little okay. bit. And so I have so many things. Um, and I love this question. How do you feel about the concept of too soon, which is something that you yeah. talked about? And mm -hmm. that is swirling in my head too. And what is off limits? What is too soon? Are there just things that are not funny? But just to stick with the language of the question, how do you feel about yeah. the concept of too soon? I'm probably the wrong person to ask because it's sort of it's sort of like TMI, right? Somebody will say this is too much information, and my response is always like, you know, no, it's not. Let's have it. It's, there's no such thing. Yeah. And I, I'm probably the same way with too soon. Um, however, I, rec I, I recognize it. It's a thing. I don't know. I mean, that's really hard to define because it's it changes so much mm -hmm. from one person to the next. It, in terms of, I mean, too soon about the pandemic. We're still in the pandemic, but but this kind of humor is resonating. Yeah. Because it's taken off. I mean, that and that really has been maybe the most impressive thing to me in in a field of a lot of impressive things. I mean, we you know pivoted to full online within a week and you know yep. that's just us the whole the world had to do that and it really is pretty impressive and one of those impressive things to me is how funny people were able to be immediately during a time that's you know technically way too mm -hmm. soon probably yep. but I also don't think it would it's not going to be funny five years from now you know yeah, let's it's hope very <laughs> context dependent I yeah. mean in some ways we are like we haven't used the word comedy as you know, you're talking about humor, but yeah. to me, in this context, they're synonymous, mm -hmm. right? And so, what I hear you saying is, no soon is too soon, right? That's how I'd answer it for me, I think. And so, okay, so here's, I'm, I'm sort of fascinated by this, and so I, do you watch at all um, Seinfeld, Comedians oh. and Cars Getting Coffee? So, I watch that show a lot for the discussion of craft. Right, mm -hmm. and the, one of the things that is clear on there is that people who do this for a living feel pressured to not talk about certain things, but it also feels like people who are just kind of whining about political correctness, right, right. At, the, at the same time. So, it, like, our, if you take something like 9-11, right, an anniversary mm -hmm. just passing, yeah. is that off limits to some people, right? And yeah. would you consider jokes about 9-11 off limits? And I'm asking that in the sense of one of my favorite jokes is about 9-11. You're talking about in The Big Sick? Yeah, in The Big Sick. Yeah. So <laughs> have, you, have you seen that? Yeah. So, how do you, so for anybody who hasn't seen it, the main character, I think he's like Indian or Pakistani, yeah. and he's not even from like... He's, he's the, not, yeah. Right, and right. so... Ray Romano asks him, have you talked about 9-11? And he says, well, with other people? <laughs> you know, how do you feel about it? And his response is, well, I feel we lost 19 of our best guys right. that day. Yeah. And they just don't know how to respond, <laughs> right. right? But to, to your point, like, there is a truth that's being presented there in the form of what their assumptions are right. of him that are, are very real. So I don't find that off limits, right? I, no, I don't either. And yeah, it's, is there, I'm trying to think of other examples like. Although part of the reason he could make that joke is because of assumptions they had about him, yeah. right? Whether they were correct or, or not correct. They yeah. were assuming that he was like somewhat on that side of 9-11. Of and it served its moment, like the something that you're saying about humor having a really contextual yeah. importance right. and just, you know, right in that, in that moment. Um, I'm going to go all over the place here. That's Are you fine. ready? So we're, we're going to switch lanes again. 
the quote that you had for uh, Mark Twain about mm -hmm. humor being, what was it, our only... Our only effective weapon, or our most effective weapon. Or weapon, something like, like that. I, yeah. I've, you know, I've not really thought of it as, or at least much as a weapon. Mm -hmm. So w what is it about that quote? Like, can you talk about <laughs> weaponized humor, if I <laughs> can use that? Weaponized humor. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, I think a lot of people use humor as a, as a defense mechanism, mm -hmm. right? To, is that a good thing or a bad thing, or neither? I, I think in in your array of options for <laughs> how mm -hmm. to combat, you know, whatever it is, bullying or um, you know, conflict. I think it's a pretty good one mm -hmm. because I think it can defuse certain situations. Yeah. Um, I think it shows creativity. Mm -hmm. I think it shows a level of emotional and intellectual control, like to be able to take a, a situation that's inherently unpleasant and filter it through a comedic lens mm -hmm. um so i'm fine with it well i mean again it's context dependent right i, I wouldn't want to use humor as a weapon to like hurt children's feelings <laughs> right that would be bad well but, phew i'm glad we got that out of right, the way yeah, yeah. just to be clear <laughs> right. but but to use it to yeah. protect oneself or to like you know shift the trajectory of a bad situation i kind of like it yeah I, there's a book that i had read that I, the title, I, I can't remember it, but it was really about activism, political activism in oppressive environments. And mm -hmm. the strategies that they were presenting were really humor based. And so one of these was, you know, instead of going and having a physical confrontation with the police and fighting and getting beaten down, was this group of people had taken a whole, like a giant box of ping pong balls with offensive messages on them and then dumped them down the stairs and uh, in a public place mm -hmm. and all of the police were required to run around and try to pick up all the ping pong balls <laughs> which has got to be the most funniest the, you know the right. most funny thing that you could see so I, hearing you say that yeah i can get, i get the the weapon yeah part of that that i mean satire has always been a really powerful thing mm -hmm. and so there is a question here um that what humorous not only make us laugh but also teach us how to write. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, what, what's the question part? So, so what humorists that you have read that oh, you okay. pay attention okay. to not only make us laugh, but also teach us how to write? How and to I would write. expand that even to teach us like how to think, how to yeah. engage. Right. Um, I mean, I have a few personal favorites. They're probably not surprising. I love David Sedaris. I mm -hmm. love his observational humor. Um, I like Bill Bryson, who, you know, is a little drier, more mm -hmm. kind of droll humor. Um, I've, there are a lot of writers I follow regularly on uh, McSweeney's uh, The New Yorker. Uh, Colin Neeson comes to mind, which you, even if you haven't read, if you don't think you've read stuff by him, you probably have. Um, Kimberly Harrington I like a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and a, a lot of this humor is also, uh, they don't, you know, see individual bylines, but like Reductress has been fantastic lately, yep. which is, you know, sort of started out as a way to mock uh, women's magazines and now has like taken on this whole feminist angle of its own that's really unique. I think it's really sort of cutting edge yeah. in, in internet satire, so. I find The Onion that way too. Like yeah. I've, there's something, I mean, The Onion is absurd in its right. own way, but there are, you know, the article that they post after every mass shooting is really powerful, and I, I, I wish I could remember, I remember the title that I could quote it, but it was, you know, we can't stop this from occurring, like says Nation, where this is the only place that it occurs. But, yeah, right, right. yes, and I've seen that one. They just yeah. keep reposting that, and yeah. over time, it, it's powerful, and it's, it's one of those times that humor makes me feel shame, mm -hmm. that I realize that it's funny, but I feel utterly shameful right. for it. And I feel like that's appropriate. I, yeah, I think it. Mm. I think it totally is. And I think there's a lot of satire that you just wouldn't even smile while reading yeah. it. There, there was one written about, um, and I think it was The Onion also about the documentary Blackfish. Remember about the the killer mm. whales that SeaWorld and you're an Ohio no, person. You uh, remember Shamu, right? Uh, uh, right. Go ahead. So yeah. and like how the whales are mistreated, yeah. and it, it was just scathing satire, but it was also heartbreaking. Yeah. It, it wasn't like ha ha funny, mm -hmm. but but it did something. It was doing something. I think of Michael Moore in that way too, like Bowling for Columbine, and yeah. And I, I guess like part of my question about 
things being off limits at, you know, I'm thinking of really painful things like Newtown, you know, yes, and, yeah. and gun violence in particular. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not the biggest Michael Moore fan, but um, Bowling for Columbine to me is a different scenario. And I've never really been able to pin down what it's so funny about that mm -hmm. movie. And it's so dark. And yeah. I mean, we're t it, Columbine is in the title, right? right? And right. that was a wildly popular mm -hmm. film. So you had mentioned some people, and you'd mentioned um, Sarah Silverman, yeah. who I love. Mm -hmm. Sarah Silverman, is, I just have a lot of admiration for her. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to ask about humor in that I think a lot of people think people are just funny right. in the mm -hmm. way that you're like a certain height right. or something, that this is a biological thing. and um, but I, I know in reading a little bit about Sarah Silverman that she works really hard mm -hmm. at her craft yeah. and comedians go out on the road and through clubs and they hone their act and uh, holy smoke. So it, is humor a craft? And, and if so, is it something that you personally have had to work at? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Can you please say more about sure. that? Sure, yeah. yeah. So I think that's such an important conversation to have. And since I'm teaching satire right now, I'm yep. having that conversation a lot because number one, it's the first time we've offered the class. So students are coming in not knowing really what to expect and it's intimidating. It's really, mm -hmm. really hard to be funny. And we just had this conversation in class the other day where I said, it, it is learnable. Like people have broken it down yep. into various curricula and strategies and filters that can be taught. Um, I, now that said, I think you have to have some. You have to have a natural sense of humor, right? You have to. I think maybe, there's some quote, and I'm, I'm going to fumble it, but it, it's something to the degree that years before you're good at it, years before you're good at creating humor, you will know it when you see it, and that's like the first step is recognition, and then from there you start working on your craft. So I think, like for me personally. And my colleagues know this in painful ways. <laughs> I've been rejected by McSweeney's more times than I can count. I, I have too. We all have, yeah. right? Like it's part of growing up as an I, I have yet to break through. I, I'm just not that fun. <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean. well I, but you could be because you could learn it, right? That's so, right. So I'd been like submitting to McSweeney's almost weekly. And then I'd come <laughs> in like every Monday and, I'm, I'm, and I'd, I'd work myself up like I'm, I'm not going to be demoralized this time. It's just a rejection. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean I'm a loser or whatever. And right. then I'd be like, I'm such a loser. I'm never going to get in McSweeney's. And, but I was just kind of throwing things at the wall because I didn't really know what I was doing. I was like, this seems funny to me. And the McSweeney's editor was like, okay, but you know, not mm -hmm. really to us. So once I started studying it, and, and I, I took the whole um, satire curriculum through Second City, which is the improv house in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And I realized, like, oh, there's, there's a format, there's a structure, there are filters, yeah. um, there, are, there are, like, unwritten rules about how to create humor, like, down to a very granular level. I mean, to the degree that certain phrasing needs to end on a joke. And certain words are funnier than other words. Words with hard consonants are funnier than words with soft vowels. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows why, but, like, they've tested this linguistically, and it's yeah. a real thing, so you can learn all this. Um, like my daughter and I have been saying the word cattywampus right, like for no funny, reason. Right? Like it's funny. I we before we even knew what it meant, we thought it was right. funny. I thought it was a creature. I was wrong, but go ahead. It sounds like it should be. It a really creature. should be like something <laughs> that lives in the forest, right? Yeah. <laughs> Which is also funny. Yeah. Um, and Scott Dickers, the um, who was the original editor and creator of The Onion. It's kind of, I've met him a couple times, not in person, but virtually. You'd never know he's funny. I mean, he's mm -hmm. nice. He's nice to talk to. But you wouldn't walk away saying, oh, my God, that guy's hilarious. But mm -hmm. we know he is hilarious because he started The Onion. And he also, he's done a lot of work toward, um, like, making it systematic, how, how to write humor. He's, he's number one, he keeps um, a Google Doc that he'll give anybody access to, which is pretty cool, called his Big Ass Cliché List. And he just catalogs humorous cliches so people stop recycling them. So that's yep. like a great check. And he's also established all these humorous filters, like you know, what makes things funny? Is it parody or irony mm -hmm. or characterization or yep. relatability? I mean, there are different like forms there. I'm thinking, like I love narrative-based humor, mm -hmm. like 
this many people walk into a bar and then you know the story that sort of unfolds from that but also humor in in written form like David mm-hmm. Sedaris although those are meant to be performed and I guess they would well, cross he over reads them. yeah so they would yeah. cross over to like an oral tradition but then you know so to me those are that I was thinking of humor as a really narrative driven environment mm-hmm. but you had mentioned and I get this from my kids all the time, meme culture, yeah. to me feels like humor is poetry. So, yeah. and you, you were talking about the dog and the, yeah. the what, I don't even know if the meme has a name. I've been banished from social media, I, so I like can't remember. It's like dog on fire meme. Yeah, I, heard, on, I heard you got banished. Yeah, so dog on fire <laughs> meme is funny in itself. But like, is there a different difference there in that humor? Like, are you someone, I mean, I've read your writing, I've heard you talk, mm-hmm. do you, are you also a secret meme maker? No. Is, because, <laughs> I want to be. Because that not, would be yeah. different. Like, is that, <laughs> right. this is a weird thing to say, but it, it's making memes just not in your like skill set. It's not. Okay. And I, I've tried. Yeah. And then, and then I run, I have a, a 23 year old son. So he's like, a, that's like the meme generation. Yeah. And I send him my memes and he's just like, no, that's yeah. not. And, yeah. I don't, I don't always get them. Um, I, I use them for this presentation because they're easy, they're an easy format because they're so short. But yep. I thought it's really hard to. I, I'd like to take a meme writing class. I, Somebody would teach that. So for me, like when we're talking about memes and humor, I I think about poetry in this way too, in that of the literary arts in some ways, mm-hmm. the the writing, the fine arts, that poetry is often the easiest because it's the most accessible. To, which I love, it's democratic. Mm-hmm. Like okay. anybody can sit down and write a, a poem in a day or just make one up in your head and memorize it, mm-hmm. you know, for that matter. But a novel, a, a different thing. And so I, when, one of the questions I had on here is like, what separates real humor from just snark or easy yeah. humor or, yeah. What, I mean, that's, what, yeah, that's hard to define. Um, I think maybe originality. When I think, like if you look at the top tier humor that's being published, it's not just sarcasm, which sometimes sounds like repetition. So if you walked in and said, you know, what a nice chilly night. And I was Mm -hmm. like, oh yeah, it's a really nice chilly night. I love being cold. Mm -hmm. Right. (laughs) Right? That sarcasm is not really that funny. Like nobody's going to publish that. There's, There's something in humor writing lingo called the unusual thing. And it's like, it's literally the unusual yeah. thing, the thing you wouldn't think of to include in that piece. And yeah. that's frequently what's get, what gets people's attention, kind of hits their funny Yeah, point. I'm trying to write an essay now on, uh, my dad once bought me a toboggan for a birthday present. I don't know why that was yeah. funny to uh, me, but uh, right, exactly. you uh, on a toboggan. Well, he, yeah. g- he gave it to me in July. My birthday's <laughs> in December. And so it's weird to get a toboggan right. by itself, but like let alone in July. When it's not your birthday. Yeah, and so yeah. it is an unusual, like I, I get the, I, I have a lot of sympathy there for the unusual <laughs> thing. And another question came through about, um, do you think humor writing is a political statement? And I wanted to tie that to the question about snark in the sense that I, I'm thinking about a stretch of our re- recent history where the Daily Show and Colbert were really sort of dominant presences in the media landscape and I and for full disclosure I I was never really a big fan my mm-hmm. personal political leanings aside like it just that yeah. I could say more about that but um, how do you think of humor writing as a political statement I think there was a debate about that and it was a few years ago and I think it was John Stewart who and Fox News was like all over his case, yeah. right? And and he ended up saying something like, I'm an entertainer. Like, I am a comedian. I'm doing a show for entertainment. So, you know, kind of get off my back because they were accusing him of not being a serious journalist. But pragmatically, a lot of people were getting their news from Jon Stewart, mm-hmm. right? And And he tended to be, I mean, if definitely slanted, he tended to have good information. Like, he, you yeah. know. He wasn't spouting nonsense, so I'm I'm not sure. I'm not sure how much intention matters, if the effect is that people are consuming it that way. And I think people are consuming it that way. The snark as yeah, I, news. Right? I felt like it. The consuming of it was kind of a dead end. Like that's what really frustrated me was, 
there would be stories about the show, like John yeah, Stewart right. lays into, so like, so what? Right, like, yeah. But what happened as a result of that, and I wanted, you know, and they even had like a fake political rally or march to Washington, yeah. and okay, great, I guess. Yeah. Um, and while I want to be snarky about that, I think about somebody like Dave Chappelle, who I really love. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to say that Dave Chappelle probably speaks about race relations in a way that reaches a lot of people, mm -hmm. but in a very clarifying and responsible mm -hmm. way. Right. So, it, I mean, do you think you can really, can you, so I consider that an achievement. Can you achieve mm -hmm. something with humor politically? I, I think you can, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think it's hard to do, right? To, yeah. to do something like at that level of Chappelle where, where it could legitimately, you know, be a part of the context of a, of a true political conversation. Yeah. And one thing I, there are, if you folks who are here literally, literally, is that the right word? Yeah, they're bodily, literally here. Yeah. You are bodily here. <laughs> if you have a question, you can like raise your hand and I'll call you out. Um, and so how do you feel about like, in getting back to the Daily Show element, like people like Bill Maher and mm -hmm. that there's, is that something that you, like how, how do you evaluate that? Like so much humor is political, I right. guess, is that yeah. I'm wondering if it is, can you just get to an overused place very quickly? I, yeah, I think mm -hmm. you can. Um, Bill Maher was probably one of my first influences mm -hmm. in political humor. Partly just, and, and this is back, I don't know what, probably early 90s maybe? When, yeah. when was politically incorrect? When was it? To, I'm not a Bill Maher fan, so to okay. me, he already seems like an eternity. You yeah. know what I mean? So yeah, you know. he he got right. He and he he was really pushing the envelope early on, which was initially what I liked about him because I'd never seen that kind of thing done on mm -hmm. TV before. But then it did quickly become too much. I, I yeah. think it. Yeah, it, it seemed to lack imagination at a, at a certain point in some ways. That there would be something that that it just becomes easy. I guess yeah. like anything else, you know, maybe yeah. you become a band and you go and you travel and you play your hits. Right. Like, yeah. I, I don't know how much preparation Bill Maher has to, has to do. Um, I want to get to the part about truth. Is it true that humor is anchored in truth? And like, do you, so I'm just going to be redundant there. I'm going to say true yeah. a whole bunch of more right. times. Like, <laughs> is it true? So it, do you find that <laughs> to be something that is true? And if so, why, why is that important? I think that... And, I, and I'm going to confess, like, I'm not sure, like, that I've really thought about this. Like, maybe there is a completely fictitious humor anchored in nothing that's true at all. There could be, right? Mm -hmm. There could be something really absurd. Like, that's, that sort of madcap genre is, is a thing. Yep. But I, I, think, I think part of why truth resonates in humor is that I think we, on some levels, appreciate being called out. Mm -hmm. Maybe just because we want to be seen. <laughs> yeah. You know, even if it's for something that's not flattering. I think yeah. it's impressive to us when we read something and, and either think, oh, yeah, like, they get me, or I'm not the only one thinking this, or... Yeah. I think there's, some, I think there's something in there that has to do with connect, connection. And I want you had used the word catharsis. Like, I'm... I mean, do we... If I just feel that, okay, we have a almost a biological need to experience a range of emotions and yeah. there's part of humor that it can be humiliating right. for you and you see that and you know that it's you but you kind of need that yeah in some way it is sort of what I hear you saying there there's a question that came across here that I think we've been circling around which is um, it, there's gonna be some air quotes involved <laughs> here so let me crack my knuckles to get ready for this yeah. so what do you feel the effects of cancel culture has been, will be, on humor and comedy? And so, you know, to me in the Seinfeld show, this is, it's normally when he, he has a diverse range of guests on, as you know, mm -hmm. but it's normally when he has on a white male sort of colleague yeah. that they almost launch in right away, like Bill Burr was on, and I remember this, mm -hmm. right away to, yeah, man, you can't say anything anymore yeah. these days. Damn, it's just crazy. So how do you... Yeah. Is, have you thought about that at all? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm kind of worried about cancel culture. 
I, I think on two different levels. One, one may be more meaningful. Um, for, for, so just to be clear, like there are people who do things that are so egregious, we should probably cancel them like yeah. forever, right? So that set that aside. But but apart from that, you know, I, I think people make mistakes. <laughs> I think I think forgiveness is a thing and probably a good thing sometimes. And I, I think that you know, to, to permanently cancel somebody over a slip of the tongue or a moment of bad judgment is, is a little bit too simplistic mm -hmm. and, and reductive. It, I mean, nobody would want their every word captured for the world to witness, yeah. I mean, right? I, I mean, we'd all be canceled. We were just on the air for five we minutes before even, we started. Right, I, I have no idea what I was saying. Phew, I'm going to have to go back <laughs> and check the recording. I, know. I don't know. Yeah, might not want to watch. Yeah. Um, so I'm worried, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm worried about it as a social, cultural, political movement just because I think it might be, I don't know, too, just, just too simplistic, I guess, to, to, to really sort of, for us to honestly grapple with the complexities yeah. of human interaction. From a, from a comedy angle, I, I'm worried, I am worried about what it'll do to humor because I think a lot of the best humor has been from people really, you know, sort of dancing along the lines, and I, I feel like people are afraid to do that right now. This is a, so. If I could use some of my one of my both of my children's favorite word is problematic, and yes. so they spend a lot of time explaining to me who or what is problematic. Is problematic, <laughs> and it it is hard to stay caught up on this. And so, I, I like I know going back to Dave Chappelle that he started to institute a rule that there were no phones allowed in his shows mm -hmm. on the road, that you couldn't record, you couldn't film, mm -hmm. because he wanted the freedom to say the, the things that he wanted to say. I, I, so I'm going to circle back to cancel culture. Like you, I appreciate that you talk about it as it's a, maybe it's not a good thing. Like I refuse to accept that it's even real, that there <laughs> is such a thing, because it Maybe it's just that I have always viewed myself as sort of powerless, that I can't imagine me having wizard-like powers where I could point at someone and say, you are canceled. canceled. <laughs> you are so canceled. Um, more like deplatforming, I think. And yeah. That there are people that we should deplatform. Right. Um, and I, I would argue that openly yeah. without, without any problem at all. Um, so I guess here's a test for what's like... Is there anything that makes a joke? Like, what is a joke that is bad? Like, what makes a joke bad? Like, bad as in offensive, as opposed to just I, lame? I don't know, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> or, as offensive. Like, yeah. I guess the, th so I guess the theory I'm working with is that any joke that is funny is appropriate, because that's the test within the genre itself. So if you say it, and it makes people laugh, that's the standard by which yeah. it is judged so the joke in, succeeded. in yeah. the genre. I mean, I'm not a big Twilight fan and the, of, mm. of the novels, but if the standard is that they were read and consumed, in some sense it, it was successful. But if a joke makes you laugh, then it's legitimate to me. Or is yeah. that too simplistic? Like, I don't know. I mean, I mean, could something be both funny, like genuinely funny, but also not OK? I don't know. I, it's a hard question. Yep, I, I feel very, I feel conflicted about this, yeah. knowing that <laughs> maybe I'm just super sensitive, right? <laughs> but there's a lot in the world that offends me, right? But I'm trying to think of a situation where I would say to someone, you can't joke about that. Right. And really what I would want to say is, you need to joke better about that. Yeah, I, I think yep. that's what it is. It's not the content, it's the angle yeah. that matters. Yep, the problem is not what you're saying, you just suck at saying it. Right, exactly, right? yeah. Although, you know, that leads me into saying, I could tell the best joke about insert completely offensive topic <laughs> yeah. and subject matter here. Um, it, can I ask, like, based on things that you've read, and like, is there a joke that you like? Like, I, I mean, I... It's been a long time since somebody has sat me down and said, oh, yeah. I want to tell you a joke. Right, yeah. You know, and you were a little hard on dad jokes earlier, and I just want to say that <laughs> I carry a deep 
respect <laughs> for, for dad, dad jokes. jokes. These <laughs> these earn me a lot of currency in my in my household. They, this is like nourishment in my household right. that come to depend on me. There are some good ones. There are some good dad jokes. Yeah. yeah. I, I, so for a surprising, okay, this is re- going to be re- really embarrassing. So a Thanksgiving, I, I live out on the west side, right? And my mother-in-law has a moral stance against frozen turkeys, right? So dead turkeys are cool, frozen turkeys not so much, so we have to get a fresh turkey, right, right, from Maplewood Meats, whatever. So I go in there, and I get the turkey, and, you know, they have it up at the counter, and then there was another guy who was like a senior citizen who was picking up his turkey. And so we both walk up to the counter at the same time, and there are two turkeys sitting there next to the register, right? And the woman behind the counter says to us, are you two the turkeys? And then the guy, he just like, he hit me in the arm and he went, did she just call us turkeys? <laughs> and I don't know what the hell happened to me, but I started laughing so hard. Like, I thought it was the funniest thing I'd ever heard. Like this joke from a thousand years ago right. that was so hysterical. Like I was crying that this was so funny. And the dude looked at the cashier and he was like, I still got it. And oh, this yeah. made me laugh right. even yeah. Yeah. even great. harder. But that's like sort of my favorite joke. And I, I tell that to my daughter and she laughs too. So yeah. there's no earthly reason to laugh at that. But it's the funniest thing I've heard like in the last yeah. decade. So is there a joke that you, that you... Like a particular joke. Yeah. Or even like a piece of writing in particular, like a specific thing. Um, well, I, the... <laughs> McSweeney's pub every year yeah. at right about this time publishes. Yes, you know what I'm getting. I do. Am I allowed to say it? Yes, the this title? is exciting. So, <laughs> this is McSweeney's probably most famous piece ever, and the title is "It's Decorative Gourd Season, Motherfuckers." Yep. And the whole thing is it's basically mocking like basic white girl culture, right? Yep. Sort of, and 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 our you know tendency to fill the house up with yeah to criticize your inner Martha Stewart right you know, yeah in some way but it's yeah. hilarious and, and every year just seeing the title makes me laugh again yeah. every year I don't even remember what year that was originally published but do you read it every year I do yeah is it funny every time that you read it <laughs> yeah I mean it's probably not as funny like the twentieth time but it's funny it's still I disagree funny. I think it's really? freaking hysterical <laughs> it's like every, every time. single time it's like, really good yeah which sort of opens up this door for like seasonal humor like you mm-hmm. know. I, I don't know, you just look at the time of year and say, well, I really need to dust off my Hanukkah humor. Right, and, yeah. or, you know, Or my Thanksgiving humor. And right. it'll be, everybody wants to write the next, it's decorative gourd season, yeah. motherfuckers, right? everybody does, that's so, true. So speaking of motherfuckers, like <laughs> profanity in general, like yeah. plays a big role in humor. And, and the profanity in that is really like the driving engine of that piece, but in a way that doesn't feel gratuitous. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. do you find profanity funny? Do you use it in your work? Like, I I do not that not that often. And mm-hmm. we talked about this in class this morning in my satire writing class. That question, like, how do you know when to use it and when not to? So, in that piece, decorative gourd season. It's a big part of the humor is the yep. juxtaposition of like this very wholesome Martha Stewart image calling everybody motherfuckers, yeah. right? And the whole piece is, is filled with f bombs. Um, what I what I t- said to my students this morning, and I, I don't know how useful this is, is, is to try to make that determination. If if that word is actually doing something, if it's elevating or heightening the humor, then have it in there. Like you don't need to take it out, you mm-hmm. know, for censorship reasons. But it's not funny just because it's a swear word yeah. to anybody other than seventh grade boys, right? Mm-hmm. So we, we were that's saying something, like, like it, because normally I laugh at seventh grade boy yeah, humor, and yeah. so I'm, I'm with you because I don't find that funny. Right? Yeah. yeah, it's it's hard. It's hard to know. We ended up going through. We were workshopping a listicle, like a that you know the list form, mm-hmm. and we we ended up going through every bullet and, and talking about like what's What's that word doing? Is it is it doing anything in here? If not, let's jettison it yep. and, and let it have its impact in a line where it is mm-hmm. doing something specific. But it's, it's a hard call to make, I think. I think in a lot of things that I've been consuming, you know, over the pandemic, Netflix, lots mm-hmm. of streaming 
that I've like wanted to, I want to send a letter to the person who's ever in charge of entertainment in the world and uh -huh. say, try to go a calendar year without make, with, with making everything and having no guns, right? Yeah, just just yeah, try it, like right. a cop show with no guns, I swear we can do it, right? <laughs> but also profanity in that way too. And yeah. you know, sort of in the way that like we append the word bitches onto right. something to try to make it funny. Like, what are you doing? I'm getting a pumpkin spice latte. Bitches. Right, and yeah. <laughs> it's just I'm sorry. Yeah. Like it, it's not it's not working anymore. Yeah. But I also have so my favorite curse word is a three syllable entity. Um, I don't see like I don't even really want to say it. It starts with a C, and it ends in sucker. Right. Okay. And I just want to say that I really love this okay. phrase. <laughs> And it's because of the hard consonants. It is. It's the yeah. hard consonants. And when yeah. it shows up somewhere, it's so surprising. You yeah. know? So I used to, my first job was bringing in the carts at a freaking supermarket mm -hmm. and putting away dairy, frozen products. And so I, you know, I used to hear my name on the speaker, Chuck, go get the carts. So <laughs> I'd go get the carts and the parking lot was uneven and one of the carts like, ran and slammed into this woman's car who was like a senior citizen and I went and I grabbed it I waved and I was walking away with the cart and she drove by me and shook her fist out of the window and she called me a cunt like <laughs> she shook her fist at me and was like you this and then drove away and I was so I was so impressed by that yeah, but yeah, like right? I, that word lodged in my heart at that moment and I felt like that this is the word for me, right. you know, and so I only use it sparingly, right. but I feel because like, it's special. Yeah. but there is something about just, just the fact that we agree that something is taboo or profane makes mm -hmm. it funny. And maybe that gets us back to the subject matter of humor mm -hmm. a, a little bit. Um, yeah. Yeah. Questions from the audience before I wrap up? <laughs> I don't know, we're, we're not funny enough yeah. <laughs> for, for questions. Um, Jenny, is there anything else you want to say? I don't think so. Thank you for having me. This has been fun. Yeah, I, I really appreciate this. I think I could talk for another couple hours. So um, if you liked what you heard tonight, our next edition of No Reservations will feature Dr. Elise Cohen. I brought my glasses for a reason. I'll just go ahead and use them now. Um, Dr. Elise Cohen, whose event is called When Policy Becomes Identity, Narratives and U U.S. Refugee Policy. This is something that uh, Dr. Cohen spends a lot of time talking about in public spaces like uh, WPR. Um, you can access the No Reservation series at the Widener Center's YouTube page and at causeeffect.org. Um, and again, uh, thanks to Kelly Strickland, uh, Kelly Desjardin, uh, Troy Williams at the Widener Center, everybody who's helped set this up thanks to the human beings who came and sat in in here tonight i can't i feel like i've been like everybody like i don't even it takes me a while to recognize there are humans here so thanks for being here um, and thanks to ryan martin and everybody in the college of arts humanities and social sciences for helping set this up um, and jenny again thanks for your time this was a lot of fun and i really appreciate it well thank you all right thanks for having me sure okay.